Good morning and welcome to Wintergreen Studios Virtual Land Art Bio Blitz. You have arrived at the session called Wildlife Rehabilitation in Spring. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Jess Pilo. I'm the project coordinator at Wintergreen Studios and I'm your video host and tech support on the call this morning. And so now I am very happy to introduce our speakers this morning. We have Leah Birmingham and Sue Meech from Sandy Pines Wildlife Center. Leah, I'm going to put you off mute and the screen is yours. Sue is just getting prepared right now for her introduction. And Sue Meech is the uh, woman who started Sandy Pines Wildlife Center. Uh, I am fortunate enough to be able to work here. Uh, it was my my goal and my dream uh, to work with wildlife one day, and um, I became a registered vet tech to help uh, facilitate that. And um, while I was in the program at St. Lawrence College, I was fortunate enough to meet um, Sue Meech, who had uh, just started uh, rehabbing um, wildlife and uh, it was growing ever bigger and she needed some help so as a vet tech student I came in and helped. So now I'm going to uh, introduce you to the woman that um, I like to say got us all into this mess uh, <laughs> and started this uh, beautiful center which helps about about 5,000 wild animals a year. So let me switch my camera around and introduce you to Sue. Good morning everybody, pleased to meet you. Um, I started this about 20, 25 years ago. Uh, it was all a big accident. I didn't mean to do it. I've always rescued animals uh, ever since I can remember. And um, uh, the lady at the Humane Society asked me if I could take in uh, five raccoons. Uh, their mother had been killed. So I started with five raccoons the first year. The second year I had 13. The third year I had 35. So I began to see a trend. Uh, I only did raccoons for the first few years, but then people started coming down the driveway with boxes with everything in it from squirrels to chipmunks, turtles, uh, even the occasional snake. Um, but uh, I began to realize that this was getting bigger than me. So I started looking around for um, some help. I had volunteer help for a while but it was getting too much. I was also working full time. Anyway, then along came Leah and she was my first member of staff on board. I locked her in a pen once for two hours. Because <laughs> <laughs> when you come out of a pen after you've worked with the animals, you automatically turn around and lock the doors. So I didn't think she was much good at first because I thought to myself, she's been gone for two hours. What could she be doing down there? And I went down the back and there she was, sitting quietly in the cage. <laughs> Playing with raccoons. Yeah. Now, as it's grown over the years, we've got a really good intern a program going. This year, it hasn't been so good because we couldn't take our overseas students. But usually we have 15 to 20 students throughout the year. This year we're seven, but we're making do with what we've got. And we've got some wonderful staff here. We're really lucky that our staff is so professional and caring. And we, we work together really well, so it's a good team. Um, I find it uh, fun to work here. Thanks, Sue. Um, so here we are. Uh, Andrea is busy taking calls at reception. Um, there is our, our kitchen area where we have volunteers madly prepping food for the animals. And then we're walking back into the hallway. So this area is uh, triage. Um, and what happens in triage is that new animals that come in are assessed in here. Uh, and they, they initially go into one of our various sized containers here. Uh, and then we do a physical exam on them and uh, decide whether or not they're gonna make a good candidate for wildlife rehab, uh, and if so, uh, where they'll go to next. This is Jean, Jean's been working with our birds this year. She was an intern last year and has come back again to join us and help uh, in our mission. Our mission to help lots and lots of animals. So, okay, we're gonna move on into, oh, I should have shown you in the door, sorry. Songbird room. So you don't always find exactly what's on the door in the room. Sometimes 
we adapt to make space for different animals as long as the animal won't stress most of the animals in the room we'll put them in there uh, for instance we admitted a young pine martin today um, and ironically it went into small mammal not so ironic it is a small mammal uh, but that's where a lot of our baby squirrels are thankfully a young pine martin is not uh, quite so threatening yet to the squirrels but eventually down the road that that wouldn't work so when birds come in here we then transfer them to a cage that we like to try to set up with branches logs fairly natural, as natural as can be in a captive situation. Uh, so they have lighting, often that's um, full spectrum lighting just to mimic what they would be getting out in the wild. And this is two uh, fledgling robins that have been in our care for a bit, both that have some medical issues. Uh, if they are perfectly healthy, uh, we send them off to two other rehabbers in the area that thankfully uh, care for songbirds um, that are orphaned because uh, their feeding schedule is pretty intense. Uh, give you an idea of that. This, this would be the schedule that the staff member that works on birds has set up. Um, so this, this gives you an idea at wherever you see a circle that means an animal needs some form of care whether it be feeding, uh, cleaning. Uh, so yeah, lots to do when you have baby songbirds around. So we're happy for all of those that uh, foster them for us. Uh, if they are injured though, they do stay here because we can provide them with the right medical care. So here we have uh, another way of marking how often they have to get fed. So this young one here has a 20 minute uh, sign on it. So every 20 minutes they're coming in and feeding this nest uh, of adorable little messy starlings. You can see the amount of feces they produce alone keeps us pretty busy. Um, and that's the other thing. We do tend to care for more of the starlings because most songbird rehabbers, uh, since starlings are an invasive species, won't care for them. So we um, care for everything here at Sandy Pines. It all has a will to live. Uh, so invasive or not, we do, we do provide them care. Uh, here's a couple of young grackles uh, and they're on 40 minute feeds. And over here we have our nestlings. So if they're in these little totes, uh, we're trying to keep them very warm. So this is a new admission today, uh, a young baby robin, uh, who's obviously very hungry. Uh, so at this size, we would be feeding them with this little tip, if I can get my camera right. And they just, open up their little mouths and in we go. So I basically feed them until they're done. They're pretty much see-through at this age, so we can see if their crop is full or if they need more food. So there's one little guy, and here's our little chickadee that came in yesterday. This one's closer to fledgling size, but because he's a bit weaker, we have been um, doing him on the 20 minute feed schedule. So he's going to be less likely to gape for me because of his age. So he, he doesn't want to uh, have, have his parents put food in his mouth anymore. He wants to pick up food. Another young starling, probably not too exciting for most of you. <laughs> um, and who else do we have? A house finch in here. So these little totes allow us to keep them all separated. So if one had a uh, disease, it could not pass it to another. So this is an, another almost fledged little uh, house finch and he's not gonna want this either because of his age. So I'm not even gonna bother him. So I am actually feeding them outside of their feeding schedule. Uh, and here we have yet another young robin. Right in here. And robins are little piglets. They'll almost always eat. So we'll see if this guy wants them. I think he's uh, maybe a little freaked out by the foam. This is, this is not what he normally sees when we open. There we go. Are you hungry, buddy? Well, I got that on you. Let's get that off. Let's get that off. So these nestlings have to be fed every 20 minutes. 
and that's from sun up to sundown. In fact, we keep going after sundown because we figure uh, uh, when they're orphans, they need a little bit extra. So that's nestlings, and then we have um, some older birds, um, older as in adults, uh, that are injured, and uh, they're in various other cages. Um, you'll notice we, we put a lot of screens over the cage, uh, especially important with adults so that they don't have to see us. Um, so there's one I can't quite see into. Uh, here's another uh, pair of young robins, uh, one who had been severely injured and, and scalped, and so he's getting a treatment on his head, but he's doing quite well. Um, and they are mostly self-feeding these two, so we're just giving them supportive care for now. So that is our songbirds. Now let's move on out into the hallway again. You see this is our, our, the way we keep track of all of the patients is we have these treatment boards. So on one area we've got all the birds that are inside and then on the other area all the bird cages that are outside and who's in them and what they need. Okay, so moving into raptors. We have somebody very adorable for you to see. Well, several very adorable little ones for you to see today. Um, so charts everywhere. All the patients that we um, bring into care get a case number. They get uh, a physical done on them on admission. They are kept track of with their chart, their record of care, everything that we do with them. Um, and here is a very adorable young killdeer. Always very sad for us when we have these guys as singles. Um, because they they do uh, quite like they're precocial and they they like siblings. So I've been playing um, kill deer songs for this one when I feed him uh, to make him uh, have a have a notion of his family. We're hoping to get another one in because they do much better in pairs or groups. And then in this cage we've got a little woodcock who's been doing really great. Uh, this little one is sometimes a very good feeder. Let's see if I can demonstrate that for you guys. He also feeds better, which I can't do right now because I, I usually play the song with my phone. Um, but if you play his parent's song, he will... Oh, no, he says he's full. They've been feeding him well enough. He doesn't need any extra from me. So you'll notice we set the cage up um, to try to mimic what they would have in the wild and try to encourage them to forage and eat. So... Uh, this guy actually needs a little bit more leaf matter, but we'll, you'll also notice we're keeping it dark in his cage because woodcocks are uh, crepuscular or nocturnal. Um, okay, and I'm just going to sneak in here and show you the barred owl, the owlet that came in last night. So an orphan, um, this one was, uh, sorry Natasha, on a Zoom presentation. Um, this one was found on the road, so good likelihood that uh, it was hit. Um, I don't know if I can shine light in here. Oops. You can see him. Um, I don't grab this light. Maybe. All right, so here he is. Uh, we do keep the owlets dark as well because they are uh, crepuscular and nocturnal, so it's easier on their eyes. Um, and you'll notice this guy, you may see it, he's got a bit of, he's got some what we call nutritional cataracts in his eyes. He also has some inflammation in the area, and he's very thin, so we know that he is definitely an orphan. Maybe his parent um, was hit on the road um, that he was found on, but he, he would still be what we call a brancher. So he wouldn't quite be leaving uh, the tree yet. He would still be in that general area. Um, I'm just gonna move this container and try to show you. Tight face, this is Natasha. Say hi, Natasha. Hi. <laughs> She's one of our amazing interns working her butt off all the summer trying to keep these animals alive and well. Okay, and this one's a pretty cool one, so I want to make sure I show you this guy. He was hit, witnessed hit by a car, and then um, he flew away from that, but hit a window after. So 
he's um, getting some anti-inflammatory care. Um, and you can see he's pretty feisty. Uh, so this is a peregrine falcon young. So we are hoping that um, with how feisty he is, he just needs a couple of days uh, and we can get him right back out there. He'll get some x-rays a little later today to make sure there's no internal uh, trauma that we missed. What am I doing for time, Jess? I still have, okay, perfect. Okay, so that's raptors and very busy and not everything in here is a raptor. There's a red winged blackbird up there. And there is a little flight cage in here that we have some, I think grackles, young grackles. There they are. I don't know if you can see them. They're messy, dirty little guys, hopping around eating. Grackles for such a beautiful bird as an adult are a pretty hideous looking young. Uh, I say that with the greatest amount of love, um, but they have quite the noise that they make. So now we're, we've moved into, and I just sort of went running through the door like I usually do. Um, we're moving into turtle room. Uh, so, so far, this is amazing. Never in the spring do you see the counter clear in this place. So very excited, except I believe that after the full moon yesterday and uh, the rain, um, we are going to be getting calls any minute about females going to lay eggs. So here we have a bunch of the males that were all injured earlier in the season. It seems like earlier uh, in the spring, we get the males moving um, from the different ponds, probably searching for ladies. Uh, and uh, and we get more male hit by vehicles. So we have a few of those in right now. This is a, a lovely painted turtle uh, with uh, what looks not so bad now because it's all taped up, but what was a, a very a very bad fracture because that whole piece um, through here was hanging off. Uh, so he is doing remarkably well. Uh, we want to keep that fracture site dry for quite a while to, to make sure that we get good adhesion on the bone uh, since the shell is made of bone. Uh, so what we do is throughout the day, every four hours, um, he will go into a water soak and then he will go back into what we call dry dock. So that's just a towel in a Rubbermaid tote uh, with some foam below for extra padding uh, and this keeps him dry for most of the time and allows them access to water throughout the day. We've got some more in here that are in dry dock and these guys uh, get drinks instead of uh, soaks. So every four hours somebody comes in here and gives them a drink and then checks off when they've done it. We also have a chart here that shows all of the medications. I don't know how well you can see this. Um, shows all the medications they are on. So this is what how we stay track. When you have 400 to 500 patients in care, um, having systems whereby you have uh, cage cards and record of care and things that remind everybody to do all of the things these animals need is very helpful, especially because we're often training new volunteers and training interns. And interns are essentially students or people of that age range that want to explore what it's like to actually work in wildlife rehab. They come and they live here at the center for a minimum of three months and they work four days a week um, pretty much from about 7 a.m. till 10 or 11 at night and they are just um, learning how to give proper care to wildlife. So uh, it's very beneficial to not only have other trained staff helping us with uh, training these interns and volunteers, um, but also to have um, fails, fail stops like this to, to hopefully make sure everybody gets the care they need. A much smaller painted turtle in this dry dock down here. He too just gets drinks. You'll notice gloves we do if we can recycle um, latex gloves that we wear to pick them up. So that is um, not only for our protection, but mo mostly for their protection. So each turtle has a set of gloves with it. And then this is helping us keep down the waste too. We tend to recycle it with the same turtle. Um, this turtle that came in um, was able to go into deeper water. Uh, so he's got a tank with deeper water. 
Here's a lovely Blanding's turtle that came in last night with a deep wound on the back here. Uh, and uh, she's going to be with us for quite a while, I think. And I do believe this is a female with eggs. So we will x-ray her later today too uh, and determine whether or not we need to um, induce her to get those eggs to come out. It might help her in her healing process if we can retrieve the eggs that she was going to lay. So as you can see, it's not, well, I mean, to you it might look like a lot, but right now to me it looks like not, not too, too many turtles. I suspect by the end of next week, this whole room will be full. Uh, and hopefully some of these guys will be close enough to heal that they'll be able to go. So down here, we've got another painted, another painted, and another painted. And many of these all came in on, on about the same day. <laughs> this is adorable. Another painted, and this guy is um, hiding under his towel. He had his head poked out, and then he saw me come near, and he went right back in. Um, so we do like to give them uh, the ability to hide from us whenever possible because none of these animals like being around their predators. Another painted, he's up here in this corner. You see we've got uh, notes, notes, notes everywhere. So we've got instructions for this guy before his soak that he has holes, he was got by a dog. We put a, um, a wound dressing in those holes before we put them in water so the water can't seep in. Uh, we have here another um, painted and then another Blandings. And this Blandings has been with us for a bit. And as of yesterday, um, I started to prep her to have uh, some zip tie um, cable mounts put on. And I can now show you, once I can find some gloves for myself, um, the, the process in which we take these cable tie mounts and turn them into a brace that holds the, uh, the, the trauma in place so that the, the bone can heal. So I'm just putting on my gloves now. Why does everything get harder when you're on video? <laughs> So this turtle has a lot of tape. And then yesterday I put on these, which will hopefully hold zip timeouts. They are uh, epoxied to the shell, which doesn't hurt the shell and it actually comes off quite easily. Um, it will allow me to put this turtle, sorry, show you something more interesting than just the table. Um, it will allow me to put this turtle into water sooner so um, the turtle will be much happier. We're always trying to balance stress um, on wildlife when they're in captivity so it's very stressful for them and stress prevents healing so whatever we can do uh, to keep them less stressed our our thought process is that they will heal faster so i'm gonna just put this time out on i want to find somebody to hold the camera for me because i'm not sure if you guys will get a good view so let's see who i can drum up oh, and the place was full a minute ago and now i can't find anyone perfect Amelia, can you do me a favor? This is Amelia, my coworker. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, can you hold the camera for a minute while I put the zip ties on? Uh, so that, because I, I, I realized that I can't do the cable tie and it's pointed. Can you okay. see it in there? Yeah. It needs to be zip tied. Oh, there. Oh, got you. Okay. Hmm. So this is a technique I learned by going to workshops uh, where rehabbers are teaching other rehabbers about 
turtle shell repair. We're big on, on going to continuing education here at Sandy Points. So I get the zip ties in there. Okay. So this pulls it nice and tight. And then you can see the shell right here where it's fractured comes really tight to the other side. And now that I got it tight, now I can cut it. And then we just cut this in too. There we go. So now that turtle um, has a shell fracture that's nice and close together, so it's more likely to heal seamlessly. Uh, unfortunately, this painted, or sorry, this Blanding's turtle got uh, a very bad um, amount of trauma. So he's got trauma to the plastron, on the bridge, on both sides. Um, but doing amazingly well despite all of that. Uh, and also is going to lose an eye in the process. This eye is not, not recovering. Um, but a one-eyed Blanix turtle should do just fine. Uh, so that's great. I'll, I'll do those other ones later. And we'll get, let Amelia get back to work. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay. So I think, Jess, that I've, I've done most of the presenting I was going to present. Do we want to start and do um, questions? Absolutely. I'm looking at the Q&A box and see we have lots of questions coming in. So I'm going okay. to open that up and we'll just start right at the top. So our first question uh, is from Rena Eupidus and she's got a, a little bit of a comment to start with. So every 20 minutes, are you kidding me? Worse than a newborn. Uh, well, I guess they are newborns. Marvelous work and a real privilege to see in the hospital. Um, quick question, how do the injured creatures find their way to you? Is it the general public that brings them in? The majority of them do come in from the general public. Uh, I would say probably 85% of them, and then another 5% through the Ministry of Natural Resources, and then another 10% through different humane societies that take them in uh, to allow people to have a close place to bring them to and then they transfer them here uh, once they're able to find transportation or if we can find transportation. So yes, the majority of them come in because kind-hearted individuals find them and want to help them out and uh, go searching and find that there is a wildlife center near them. Wonderful. Now our next question is from Consuelo. They say amazing tour and passion for your work. Thank you. And their question is how are you funded? Uh, that's a great question. We are uh, funded by donations uh, and fundraising alone. There is no government funding in wildlife rehab in Canada. So all of the work we do is done because uh, our community and, and supporters worldwide really at this point uh, donate to us. And if it wasn't for them, we, we wouldn't be able to do this work. Perfect. And we have a question from Monica. Can, how can someone volunteer? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so you can simply volunteer by going to our website and, and there will be prompts there that will lead you to how you can help. Uh, and there are different ways to volunteer. So there's hands-on here at the center, uh, which a lot of people like. Uh, and then there's also fundraising. There's helping us just even with daily cleaning can be really overwhelming at this time of year when patients are coming in so fast that um, we're, everybody that's here is doing all we can just to stay on top of feeding and cleaning the patients in a day. So um, just helping, having people that want to volunteer and help uh, do laundry and, and clean doors, especially with COVID this year, we've, um, you know, trying to stay on top of keeping every surface that is touched multiple times by humans uh, disinfected throughout the day. So that's, that's just yet another extra, as we're all experiencing, extra steps to our life uh, with COVID. Great. Thank you, Leah. And follow-up question, are you taking on new volunteers right now? We are. We just started um, uh, doing that again. We had been not taking any volunteers and, and in fact, had actually stopped our, our current volunteers from coming through the initial stages of the COVID isolation. But uh, we, we have been able to, as the government slowly opens things up, we are too doing that. So we introduced a few at first of our 
of our key long-term volunteers that could work independently uh, so that we could social distance better. And over time, I mean, it's just really hard in a place like this uh, to care for, I think it's about 450 animals that we have in care today uh, without coming fairly close contact. Uh, so what most of our staff and volunteers are trying to do is just not um, just do the bare minimum in our regular lives. So that's how dedicated we are, I guess, that uh, we're, we're, not, we're not exposing ourselves outside of Sandy Pines if we can avoid it. Great, thank you. Another question from Monica. How can we donate resources and do you have a wish list? We do have a wish list. It's on the website as well. Uh, and sometimes the various versions of it circulate on our Facebook page. Uh, the the um, wish list uh, usually involves things like unsalted nuts. We go through so many nuts in this place, uh, it's not even funny. A lot of the young rodents um, are big fans of uh, pecans, walnuts, almonds, uh, and seeds too. So pumpkin seeds, um, sunflower seeds. And uh, so that's certainly buying us anything like that. Toilet paper, paper towel, and laundry soap. I mean, we can never have too much of any of that. Bleach uh, is another thing. So all of those things are constants on the wish list and, and, and easily accepted at any time. Um, and usually we post on our Facebook page when we have immediate needs. So when we get a lot of raptors and a lot of predator animals in, we will start going through more meat. And we ask people that have... Uh, meat in their freezer that they might be able to pass on to us uh, to give us a call and bring that in. Uh, so right now we're good for that end of things, the, the freezer burnt meat, but uh, we do put out pleas as we need them on, uh, on our Facebook page. Perfect, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Thomas Sears. First he says, amazing work. And he wonders what kind of epoxy you use on the turtle shells. Well, that's a great question. Um, and I will show them right now. Um, so this is the one I'm, I'm currently using that I like. Oh, wait, sorry, gonna have to switch my camera around again. Um, Quick is, is great. There is actually a 90, a 90 second epoxy um, that I was using, but unfortunately it's, uh, it produces a lot of heat and I think it actually was burning um, their, their scoots on their carapace or plastron. So I have changed to this uh, five minute epoxy. It seems to be uh, water resistant and, and holds uh, much nicer. So uh, I'm using that one right now. Um, but yeah, basically anything that can be waterproof and, uh, and sets fast because <laughs> uh, turtles aren't very patient. Uh, and they don't like to, believe it or not, sit around while, while I put these things on. So I pretty much have to prep my epoxy and get it on just seconds before it sets um, so that they will stay still long enough for it to not shift on me. Thank you. Uh, we have more questions for you. How many staff are at the hospital? And I'll add a follow-up. How many volunteers do you have as well? Okay. So I think at one point we had had it estimated like volunteers from all the different areas. So between transporting, fundraising, um, outreach and awareness, and, uh, and hands-on at the center, I believe we, we have around 200. Uh, hands-on at the center, there's usually one or two every day. Uh, so probably about 14 consistently that have been coming out for years um, that, that have a specific day of the week that they come. Uh, and then that varies because we'll get new people interested. And so you'll have influxes. Um, and then some people will realize like how much work this really is. Like this is a lot of dirty, thankless work, um, more than it is um, cuddling cute little animals. Uh, it, it's, it's cleaning after those cute little animals and, and feeding them and then trying to stay on top of everything uh, cleanliness wise here. So um sometimes volunteers fade away because they realize that it's you know maybe not totally what they were looking for and uh so yeah i'd say uh, about 
200 with all the volunteer drivers too, because we have people from all over Eastern Ontario that we can call upon when we need to get an animal here. And if they're available, uh, they drive. If not, then we just keep calling other names on the list. Did I answer the question? <laughs> you did. You did answer for volunteers and we're wondering about staff as well. How many staff? Oh, right, staff. So we have about six uh, full time all year round. And then we have about another seven or eight seasonal. So um, we are fortunate uh, this year. Um, I think there must have been some extra funding. We got some extra uh, grants from the government to help um, bring in staff, which worked out really well. As Sue mentioned, our intern program was cut right down. Normally I have 12 of them on the go at this time of year. And instead this year we just have five. So thankfully with uh, the little bit of um, grants that were out there, we were able to uh, get more staff on. So that's been really beneficial this year. Fantastic. All right, it looks like we've got a couple of more questions. Um, what kind of turnaround time does an injured animal spend at Sandy Pines? That's a great question. And it varies depending on the injury. So, um, you know, some wounds can take a long, long time to heal. The stress level of the animal is another factor. If this is a high stress animal, it might actually take longer uh, for it to heal properly. So um, it can be anywhere from two weeks to half a year. Uh, I think the longest we had was a turtle that had been kept as a captive and had some serious shell uh, damage because of that. Um, we did know where that turtle had originated from, so we were able to get him back there eventually. But he was almost two years in care before we got him back. Great, thank you. And we have a question that you've spoken to a little bit already. Uh, what happens if you find an injured or abandoned animal, but you're not able to bring them into the hospital yourself? you don't have access to transportation. So can you tell us more about the volunteer drivers? Yeah, so from most of the, the towns in and amongst Eastern Ontario, uh, people that want to volunteer call us, give us their, their information and their availability. And um, we keep that in a log and, and basically a phone book of our own. And if we know we have an animal in Kingston, we'll flip to the Kingston section start calling Kingston volunteers and see who's available. Uh, some, some towns, obviously, we don't have near enough. So we can always, always, always use more volunteer drivers. And you'll find some people, you know, just life changes. You were available a lot one summer, um, but the next summer, you know, life got busy and you, and you don't for whatever reason. So there's a lot of variability and a lot of change there. So it's great to have new volunteers constantly joining that list. Uh, and willing to drive for us because that's how a lot of the animals end up coming in here. Super, thank you. And we'll do one more question. And uh, this is a question from me. Um, I know that spring is a busy, busy time of year at Sandy Pines. So I'm curious how many animals you typically have in care in the spring versus a different season, say fall or winter. Okay. So spring can, I think um, probably the height of it is, is going to be around 500 on average. Um, and then come the fall, we're, we're down to often uh, 200 to 150 patients in care. Can be even less um, right through winter. Sometimes uh, we're down to, because uh, we're not, like in the spring you get litters in, right? So you get litters of squirrels and litters of raccoons. So they're kind of like one patient, but several, <laughs> um, but one admission, let's say, with several patients to it. Uh, whereas in the winter, you're usually dealing with trauma, you're dealing with adults, and you're not dealing with litters. So your numbers of admissions are going to go lower. Um, and also certain species are going to be not as active. So anything that um, should be hibernating is probably not going to require care unless they have hybrid problems with hibernation um, so and we will have turtles over the winter that we're not ready for release um, hatchlings that may be hatched a little late because we do if a turtle dies I don't think I mentioned this earlier 
the turtle dies in care or we have to euthanize it because it's not going to survive its trauma, um, if it's female, we'll remove the eggs and we uh, incubate them and hatch them out here. We get as many out as we can in the fall, but sometimes you get pretty late in the fall while some are still hatching and uh, we don't like to put them out at that point then. So we overwinter them and give them what we call a head start. Thank you, Leah, for answering all of those questions. No problem. Thank Our you for asking them. Oh, my pleasure. We are at the end of our session, so I just wanted to say thank you so much for giving us this tour. It's really special for us to see what goes on behind the scenes, um, and it's so clear how passionate you are about the work that you do, and it really shows in the care of, of each patient you showed us today. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for your interest and. In and thank you for shining a light on the work that we do here. I am very proud of it. <laughs> <laughs>